Tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome everyone to the seventh online seminar in our Marine Biosecurity Series. Uh, this uh, series of seminars has been hosted by both the Top of the North Marine Biosecurity Partnership and the Top of the South Marine Biosecurity Partnership. Um, these are both groups who are working together um, to stop the spread of marine pests in the North Island and the South Island. Uh, these seminars have been really well supported <laughs> by a wide range of people and organizations and thank you very much to all the speakers and the, the participants who have contributed their time. Today we have three representatives from the top of the north. Uh, they are with the council's marine biosecurity teams that are behind the Clean Below Good To Go brand that you are hopefully very well familiar with by now. Um, we, <clears throat> our speakers are Samantha Happy from the senior, marine, she is the senior marine biosecurity advisor at Auckland Council. Kate and Leonard, <clears throat> who is the Biosecurity Manager Marine at Northland Regional Council, and Biosecurity Officer Andy Wills from Bay of Plenty Regional Council. We do aim to be finished within an hour. Uh, please keep your, your microphones muted unless you're speaking, just to keep background noise down. If you have a question, raise your hand and, and we'll come to it. Um, if you can just state your name at the beginning of the question and the organisation you represent, if, if you do represent one, um, that would be great. Great. You can <clears throat> also post your questions into the chat box. Um, this seminar is recorded and like the others, it's available after the event on YouTube for you to watch or share. Uh, Samantha is first of all going to present an overview of the Top of the North Marine Biosecurity Partnership. Samantha, over to you. Thanks, Zoe. Kia ora everyone. Um, so yeah, really we're just going to be talking about the Top of the North Marine Biosecurity Partnership today. Um, you can see the vision there on the screen. I'll let you read through that. But basically, we are a group of agencies who officially um, established the partnership in 2016. And then a few joined on in 2017. So we've been working together for quite some time now. Um, and the current members are Northland, Auckland, Waikato, Gisborne, Hawke's Bay Councils, also DOC and Biosecurity New Zealand. And then yes, we do try and work closely with Top of the South and um, Environment Southland and Fiordland Guardians, keep in touch with them as well. So that's kind of the three main areas that have partnerships um, currently running. In New Zealand. So here's a nice picture to give you a, a visual of the area that we cover, um, noting it's the west coast as well as the east coast. And um, so basically that eastern seaboard is where majority of the boating occurs in New Zealand. We've got 70% of New Zealand's marine um, vessel fleet, like the domestic fleet, and about um, most of the movements of the vessels happen in this area as well. So people shifting between the regions and um, that's where we focus a lot of our attention is um, working in this area of looking at biofouling. So that's what grows on the, the bottom of boat hulls basically. And uh, we've got evidence that can attribute up to 90% of the marine pest spread incursions um, to biofouling, so we really focus on biofouling. Next slide there Zoe, thank you. Yeah, so I mean when we started the partnership there were actually some councils who've been working together for quite some time in this space, um, namely Auckland, uh, sorry Northland <laughs> and Bay of Pliny, who are also going to be talking today, um, and Marlborough District Council, they are kind of the longest standing councils who have really been doing a lot of mahi for a long time, so just acknowledging that. Auckland came on board in 2016 um, and yeah we've had a program ever since then. But basically we're working together to stop the spread of marine pests through our regions and um, yeah, educating, but it's all part of this bigger picture. So um, this slide kind of demonstrates that. So you've got you know, international vessels coming in. So there's strategies in place to try and reduce the um, risk of incursion coming in via those vessels. Um, we've got the 
craft risk management standard, um, which is actually a world first in that kind of um, regulatory space. So people have to send through evidence before they even enter our waters that they have been maintaining their biofouling on their health. And um, so that's the pre-border system. And then we have a whole range of surveillance um, and horizon scanning that helps to identify, you know, target out areas where we can do surveillance. Um, Andy's going to talk to that a bit more a bit later on. And um, so we call that high-risk site surveillance. We also have high-value areas and a whole lot of research to try and help us detect these species nice and early. And then we have pathways management, um, which is really about managing those various ways that marine pests spread around, which isn't only biofouling, can also be um, like the Coleopa has demonstrated to us all recently. It can be via, um, you know, growing on the ground. So it can be spread by anchor. It can be in holding tanks, bilge water, ballast water, um, through stock movement associated with fisheries and marine aquaculture. That's all pathways. And then, yes, we have marine pest management. So that's kind of once something has been detected, then do we, you know, what the various interventions we can use to combat those incursions, which might just be education. It might be through to eradication attempts of sending in divers. So the Mahi, we work together in collaboration and we share resources, information, really just makes it way more efficient across agencies. We're all on the same page. Um, we do have varied programs in saying that, but we all have the same vision that we share. Um, we do a lot of engagement together, communications, um, webinar series. <laughs> And uh, we'll talk more about the education kind of side of it and the communications, the clean blow, good to go. And we do boat shows. Um, some of us have ambassador programs in Auckland because um, we've actually got the majority of the boat fleet and sadly are a bit of a marine pest sink, meaning that we already have some established uh, marine pests, mainly in the Waitamata Harbour. Um, so we have an outreach program that really works closely with the marinas and the boaties, and we have um, biosecurity champions, we call them, that, uh, over summer, over the busy period, we send them out to the marinas and some of the busy boat ramps, some of the parks, a number of events, just to really engage and have some good conversations and raise awareness of the issues and impacts. Um, then we also have an e-newsletter. If you haven't signed up for that, please do. Um, we've got our main um, website as well, marinepest.nz, so go visit that. So he's moving me along. <laughs> so we, um, we, of course, like anything, we've had some challenges um, along the way. We realised some of these quite early, which is kind of why we have got to where we are now through the years. So social licence, you know, that's meaning it's quite hard for people to appreciate issues when they can't see them and when they're out of sight, they tend to be out of mind. So, you know, divers are under there all the time seeing the changes that are happening underwater, but a lot of people just don't really see those changes. So we really need to be visualizing and communicating that as much as we can. And we all have currently different rules between the regions, um, ranging from essentially none through to um, regional pathway management plans through Biosecurity Act and the RMA and um, it does cause a bit of confusion so and we also have varied levels of support um, from you know, various stakeholders or politicians and so on and then the resourcing is reflected in that. So handing over now. Excellent. Um, well, thank you, everyone. I'm just going to have a um, yeah, quick, quick little um, chat about some of the uh, marine pests that we have programs for um, in the top of the north regions and um, discuss a little bit of a case study of how um, working together um, collaboratively and with uh, relevant stakeholders really does impact the success of some of the work we do. 
Um, so here we have a, um, a number of um, introduced species, marine species um, that we have across the uh, top of the North regions. Um, I guess here I should note that there are around over 200 non-Indigenous marine species in New Zealand. Um, not all of these do have recognised impacts. Um, not to say that there aren't, but there aren't um, noticeable impacts on those values um, like our cultural, social and economic values. Um, these species who uh, we've got up on the screen here um, do, and they have had significant impacts um, overseas as well. Um, so I guess it should also um, be said here that New Zealand has managed to keep out a lot of species that have caused impacts in New Zealand. And really this can be attributed to those um, uh, pre-border and border um, efforts that uh, Sam just spoke about. Um, so looking at these pictures in the top um, left-hand corner there, we have Sabella Spellandani. Um, across to the right is um, Eudistoma, the Australian droplet tunicate, um, down to the um, bottom, Bottom left corner there is um, Clavelina um, oblonga, um, which is a new to New Zealand species detected at Great Barrier Island. Um, we have uh, Stella clava there, and again, um, Sabella spelanzani. Um, and these are these are species that um, we have programs currently um, that we're trying to minimise impacts from. Um, if you jump to the next slide there. Okay, um, so one, one species um, that most people have heard about um, is uh, the Mediterranean fan worm. Um, and yeah, this was first detected in Littleton Harbour in 2008. Um, and then again, um, detected in Auckland Viaduct in 2009. Um, and fortunately at the time it was decided that um, nationally we didn't have the tools to eradicate this species. So um, it shifted from a response um, into a long-term management. Um, and this was in 2010. And that means that the responsibilities um, really transitioned from central government to relevant local bodies, um, uh, supported both financially and in an advisory capacity by Biosecurity New Zealand. Um, so a little bit about um, the Mediterranean and fan worm. Um, it really exhibits these weedy characteristics. It's highly fecund, meaning it has a um, uh, quite a large reproductive capacity, um, estimated that one female in, in her peak can have around 50,000 eggs during each spawning event. Um, and it is hypothesized that they can spawn a number of times a year. Um, one general consensus is that um, there is a, a peak in spawning um, from May to late September oh, in central New Zealand. Um, so Sabella um, reached this reproductive um, uh, reproductive size of around 120 to 150 milli millimetres, and they can um, reach this um, really quickly, um, especially in northern New Zealand. Uh, they are able to regenerate body structures if damaged. Um, so if you do take one of these and break it in half, they're able to um, then grow into two worms. And this really has implications for how we manage this species in water. We have to be um, very careful or we can actually exacerbate the problem. Um, so there are no known predators um, for Sabella in New Zealand. Um, and this can be attributed to um, the fact that they bioaccumulate arsenic. They take arsenic from the um, water water column and metabolize it into um, quite, a, quite a nasty organic form of um, arsenic. So not very palatable to our New Zealand species. Um, they are habitat generalists, meaning they can settle on most substrates. Um, even in sort of sandy environments, they're able to find a little bit of shell grit or something like that to um, settle on, uh, metamorphosize and grow. Um, and they really do, um, show a uh, high preference to settling on artificial substrates. So these are those really um, disturbed environments um, like uh, marinas, ports. Um, and unfortunately, they, they do show a um, high propensity to settle on um, vessels, which then um, yeah, contributes to their spread around New Zealand. Um, they are gregarious, meaning that they settle um, in clusters near 
um, adults. And again, this can be probably due to their um, reproductive strategy. Uh, they're male, female, dioecious. Um, the, the male has, he um, sperm casts, so um, releases his gametes into the water column. The female then has to collect these gametes and she uh, sorry, fertilizes um, those eggs in her uh, salinic cavity and then releases these into the um, water column. Um, and so you can imagine when you do have a very uh, sparse um, population with very low densities, this does impact on um, the reproductive success. Um, and this really does highlight the need to, um, for early detection and to um, get in there quickly once we do find um, this species in a new geographic location. Um, and all that sort of is a good segue into, um, we did find um, Sibelis Spallanzani in Tutakaka, that nice um, little harbour in the middle there. It was reported to us um, by Bay of Plenty Regional Council who picked up a vessel in Tauranga. Um, and then they um, traced this vessel back. Um, it was an awkward vessel that had spent some time in Tutakaka Marina. Um, so that network of reporting um, really led to us being able to uh, form a plan with Biosecurity New Zealand quickly and then get divers in the water to survey all the available substrates and, um, and, and remove uh, a very small population. Um, we continued to do this, um, with, sorry, that was in 2015. And um, our last detection was in 2017 and we haven't found any individuals um, since then. So we are very confident, um, and this is backed up with um, eDNA results from the Cawthron Institute, that we ha have been able to really manage this population. Um, and simultaneously, while this response was going on, the marina with other marinas in Northland developed what we call a, a six in one rule where um, the marinas don't let vessels come into their facility um, that haven't been lifted and washed within six months or anti-fouled within the last month. Um, so this really shut the back door because as you can imagine, um, getting in there and doing all this mahi is um, really not valuable if um, the back door is open and there is a greater chance of um, reinfection. So um, really that, that strong collaboration between the regions and stakeholder buy-in um, did mean that this um, eradication attempt was successful. Um, sorry, Zoe, we can jump to the next one now. I put it asleep, there we are. Um, so the next species I'll talk about is uh, Cribdis japonica, the Asian paddle crab. Um, and this is a large swimming crab, uh, uh, very similar in size to uh, Overlippies, our native um, swimming crab. Uh, this one can be distinguished from the native um, as it has uh, six spines before the eye stalk there and five um, sharp spines on its claw. Um, the native species um, only has five um, spines before the eye stalk there, and they're quite rounded. Um, this, this species is very aggressive, and um, uh, na the native species has been found in the gut, gut content of um, Charybdis, um, which is yeah, always unfortunate to see. Um, again, it's uh, highly fecund, meaning it's got a um, uh, high reproductive capacity, um, and it is... A, um, hypothesized that one female can have around 4 million eggs um, in, in her lifetime of around four years. Um, and in environments where there is nothing regulating their, um, this population, like uh, predators, parasites, um, and diseases that they've left, left behind in their, their native, native habitats, um, yeah, nothing's regulating their population and they really are able to um, grow at a, um, at, a, at a very fast rate and um, impact our Kai Moana. We can jump to the next one. And the last species I'll, I'll quickly touch on um, is, sorry, uh, genus uh, Clavelina. And we've had um, two introductions in the top of the north um, area. 
The first being a new to New Zealand introduction, and that was um, detected by Auckland's uh, surveillance at um, Great Barrier Island. Um, uh, unfortunately, again, this was deemed as um, we don't have the tools to uh, eradicate this nationally. Uh, this is a colonial species, meaning that um, it can be made up of thousands of individuals. Um, so it's able to reproduce uh, both sexually and asexually. Um, so if you are to, to break up a clump of these individuals and they are um, able to spread, they're able to regrow. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, we do, really don't have a lot of, um, lot of tools at the moment to, to deal with this type of species. Um, and the second is um, Clavelina uh, lepidophorus. And it's been historically known to um, sort of the southern waters, um, namely Nelson. It's, it's quite prolific in um, Nelson. And unfortunately, we did um, find this on a vessel in um, uh, Whangarei. And that was traced back to Auckland. Um, and they subsequently found that they had a quite a large multi-generational population there. Um, since then, we have found a population here in Whangarei and also in Tauranga. Um, and this species does um, grow really quickly and is able to smother native, native species and is really um, dominant on those hard substrates. Um, again, this species is able to regenerate. And I think in literature, it says um, it can regenerate from um, even 0.2 of a millimetre um, piece. So unfortunately, getting in there and really trying manual removals um, is not an option at the moment. Um, and I will pass you over to Andy now to talk about some of their surveillance. Yeah, thanks, Caden. Uh, kia ora koutou, everyone. Yeah, I'll mainly be talking about the surveillance programs. Um, yeah, so in the hunt for marine pests, Biosecurity New Zealand contract NIWA to carry out high-risk site surveillance. Um, surveillance is carried out every six months in New Zealand's 11 busiest international shipping ports and harbours. Uh, that sampling's focused on the habitats and locations where marine pests are not currently in New Zealand are most likely to be found. And in addition to this, the various regional councils carry out their own dive surveillance in a wide sort of range of locations from areas like Great Barrier or Bay of Islands and, and uh, all the various harbours. Uh, each regional council prioritises the sites which they monitor uh, predominantly based around the more sheltered areas where marine pests are better able to survive. So in the Bay of Plenty, uh, you can see in the picture there at the top, these are the sorts of areas, you know, there's quite large areas that we're surveying. Um, so at a high risk site, such as a marina, a full inspection will be carried out three times a year. Um, this includes all the vessels, the pontoons and the seafloor uh, within the marina as well. Um, and they can all sort of hold marine pests, so it's quite a big area to cover. Uh, and also all other moored vessels in the Bay of Plenty harbours are inspected twice a year, uh, as well as large areas of the seafloor. Um, yeah, so if any pests are found, they're removed straight away by the divers. And if they're found on a, on a vessel, the vessel will be hauled out of the water and then the pests can be removed before they become a bigger issue. So with early detection, the marine pests are able to be removed before they become established. Um, if the marine pests are left to breed, the population will quickly grow and then obviously increases the cost to remove them as well. So in the Bay of Plenty, our worst incursion of Mediterranean fanworm occurred from a boat owner scraping down their hull. And we knew this occurred because a number of the fanworm were attached to large rust flakes um, scattered in an area of the seafloor, and you can see that from the picture in the top left there. So we removed 90, 944 fan worm over a five hectare area. It took a four man dive team 20 days to remove all the fan worm. So without this early detection, this would have become a much bigger issue. Um, yeah, but in the Bay of Pliny, we've been able to keep on top of the Mediterranean fan worm numbers just through regular surveillance. Um, we're still finding 
um, some on vessels with, um, which have been out of the region and then returned. Um, so you just really need to keep vigilant with it at all times. Yeah, next slide, thanks, Zoe. Uh, yeah, so the Marine Vessel Portal has been developed in collaboration with all the top of the north agencies. And it collates all the data, all the dive surveys, the hull surveillance and boat maintenance data for the top half of the North Island. Um, the picture shown here yeah, shows a number of hull inspections that have been carried out in a particular area. So in this case, it's up in Northland and the level uh, of fire fouling, which was found on each vessel. Uh, it also shows that there were no marine pests found in this area, all on a dashboard, which is easy to interpret. So, and also uh, vessel owners are able to record information about their vessel and add that in um, with haul out receipts, for example. And yeah, so to date, close to 10,000 vessels have been loaded into the port hole, um, which you know, is, a, is a good good part of the fleet. Um, all the data is stored online and easy to, easy to access. Um, it's also able to be viewed in real time. So managers are able to see the most up-to-date information, which is great. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, back to Sam Happy. Thanks, Andy. Right, so the positive impact of education. Um, education is really important, right? I think we're all aware of that. When we say education, we're meaning engagement and all levels of, um, from communications, marketing, so on. Um, really for Clean Blow Good To Go, which is our um, collaborative campaign or brand, um, whichever you like to call it, and includes marinepest.nz, our website page. So what we're really aiming to do is to communicate with um, boat users, make them aware of their role in preventing the spread of marine pests and just really raising awareness too. So, you know, they're, they're our eyes. They're the ones who are out and about. Um, they can help by reporting pests in new places. And um, yeah, so really raising the awareness and also that building the social license like we were talking about before. Um, next slide, Zoe. Cool. So part of the campaign, I mean, we've got a whole communications plan that we have. Um, we developed in collaboration and we do, you can see Caden um, talking about marine pests at one of the boat shows. Um, we usually have display tanks set up and um, all sorts of you know, engagement tools. So we've got hats and t-shirts and so on that if people are super You just muted me Zoe, that's all right, I'll forgive you. Um, yeah, lots of different tools. Um, so we do as many events as we can with the key impacts. So that would be the boat shows, Touch Wilco, Auckland on Water, boat show, uh, marina open days, any other days we can do um, to get a good reach. The e-newsletter e I already touched on before. There's some really great articles in there. Um, they're also available on our website on the marinepest.nz. Um, so if you want to you know go back and read any of them feel free uh, we're working with mana whenua um, more and more and um, i think there's some really cool case studies that we don't have time to go into um, more detail right now but um, for instance northern regional council are working quite closely with um, patuhara kiki up in uh, Whangare harbour and doing some really great work in that space with them getting them involved in marine biosecurity firsthand in the water. And it's really exciting to see. Hopefully we'll see more of that um, cross country really. Um, summer outreach program for Auckland and we're also developing, well, we're actually in the piloting stage, testing out a um, education resource that we've developed. Um, really, really great to see, um, you know, we really, and here's a bit of an example extracted from that, it's year, targeting year five to eight students, so that really important age where they're quite influential on parents and so on. Um, but, you know, really working with the next generation because, I mean, they're the ones 
who we're leaving this legacy behind to. Um, and so we really want to educate them. And like this picture demonstrates, the, the impacts of marine pests can be quite devastating. Um, this is one of the sea stars that isn't in New Zealand yet. And it's rather terrifying once it arrives, it turns from one to millions and not long. Next slide, Zoe. Here's just some examples. Um, got Alice there from Northland doing an educational day. Um, students doing Caribbean trapping, the Asian paddle crab. Um, there's a few shots there from Aotea, Great Barrier Island, Auckland Council supports a program out there, um, which is really community led and getting the kids involved and you know, actually getting out and about and learning the pests usually along with the natives as well. So it's a nice package there of biodiversity and biosecurity. And uh, yeah, really, really great day. So I think we all enjoy this part of the work. Um, there's also, I should mention, so the, the community trapping projects, there's also some being run in Bay of Plenty and in Northland for, um, I know there's one at Nungaru. Next slide, Zoe. Cool, okay. So as part of the Top of the North, um, we do have a operational framework that we all have agreed to. And under that, there's all the various work stream areas. So we've touched on the education, but that's also your education, behavior change comms. Um, we have surveillance work streams and we have policy development. So one of the key policy developments that we have um, achieved so far is the Clean Health Plan, which is formerly called the Interregional Marine Pest Pathway Management Plan. Um, we shortened it and made it more specific to the biofouling, which is what we're really concentrating on, the clean hulls. So we really wanted to look at if there were better ways to stop marine pests from spreading. Um, there were quite you know, high rates of spread. Um, great to see our educations having some impacts and there's been a you know, lesser amount of incursions across our regions um, since we've started that work. But really we found that there were some key differences in um, council support resourcing. And as I was saying earlier, the regional rules um, and also our programs. So having a range of rules was confusing for everyone, um, not just us across agencies, but for you know general public. And then we also were experiencing a bit of lack of enforcement across um, you know, at a national level, it's quite hard to actually action on boats at the higher level of the Biosecurity Act. So we're working towards um, an interregional pathway management plan. So the four regions working together in the top of the north, um, as we mentioned before. So we've got the majority of the fleet makes sense that we lead the way in this space. And we have been, I think, so boats moving between harbours and regions, um, you know, the key reason that pests seem to be spreading at this stage, working together and um, trying to reduce the likelihood of an incursion. Next slide, Zoe. Cool, so the what we've done so far to date in this space, um, it was actually instigated in 2017, so hope you can appreciate it. It's been a bit of a timeline and here we've tried to briefly capture it for you. Um, back in 2019, we sought and gained approval from all the chief executives from those four regions um, through UNISAR, which is a platform that they use to get together and have these discussions. Then we had an informal consultation period. So informal meaning that um, we didn't have to do it. So it wasn't an official consultation, but we wanted to actually go out and talk to people and find out what they thought before we progressed any further. So we released a discussion document and that um, consultation period ran from for a few months, um, March to May in 2019. Then we analysed the feedback, um, drafted a report, and that was released publicly later in 2019. And then early 2020, we really progressed on, from what we learned from that, um, did a bit of an options analysis, and then we really started building on that, um, moving forward through our various 
uh, agencies and channels and systems and processes, we've managed to work our way navigating through that and um, we undertook more of a engagement process with our key stakeholders and mana whenua um, over the last couple of years. So at this stage, we have drafted a, um, a formal pathway management plan, which is under the Biosecurity Act. And we've also got a whole bunch of supporting information um, to, to go along with that to meet the requirements under the Act. So it's a cost benefit analysis and a whole variety of other papers. Um, and we have been continuing the stakeholder engagement throughout that whole process as well. So it's been a bit of a journey together. Um, that was the name of um, our discussion document, it was Better Ways to Stop Marine Pests, um, quite self-explanatory. And it is, it is a um, work piece for the four regions, um, just acknowledging that the Top of the North Partnership actually does involve other partners, but they perhaps weren't mandated to be part of it. So just um, really it was focused on Northland down to Bay of Plenty at this stage. The support from Biosecurity New Zealand. And then, uh, yeah, so we, we, we were really happy with our in, informal consultation in 2019. 370 submissions is quite epic, really. Um, lots of great feedback from who, you know, the very, the key stakeholders uh, we've got New Zealand Marina Operators Association we try to work closely with. They represent all of the marinas across New Zealand. Um, we've got commercial fishermen, we've got different conservation groups, Agriculture New Zealand, other councils, New Zealand Defence Force and so on, um, and individuals of course. So we're really, 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 really happy with that and the options, um, there's just a quick snapshot there, I won't read it all out, but um, Basically, it was status quo, don't change anything, or did they think that we should lead the way with consistent rules for biofouling, or did they think that we should go further and um, go towards rules for all of the pathways? So the outcome of that was that um, option two was definitely the go. So hence where we are now a few years later was um, really looking at clear, consistent rules for biofouling. But there was also a strong indication that we should be working towards um, other pathways as well. So more over the longer term, and this is the draft rules at present. So we're looking at, as I keep saying, biofouling. So one of the key rules is that all marine craft um, that are high risk, so that sit in the water majority of the time, um, either on a mooring or um, berth, in a marina berth, um, obviously excluding trailer boats. So all of those boats um, need to have a clean hull when they move. And there's also a rule looking at the um, gear and equipment that is associated with being in water. And also one around marine structures, but excluding, excluding the um, agriculture farms. So the marine structures rule is really still focusing on the movement of vessels, so the, the high risk um, structures that receive a lot of boats coming through um, past that structure and pausing long enough for a marine pest to jump ship, basically. And we're looking at the four regions, the Upper North Island area, out to our um, territorial sea limit, so the 12 nautical mile limit. And next slide, Zoe. Cool, that's just really some more detail about the, um, the actual rules. So that you kind of read through that in your own time, but um, it is really focusing on that simple message of, you know, really just trying to maintain the growth on a hull to a slime layer and barnacles only. Um, that is the acceptable standard that has been proven to be you know of lower risk of spreading marine pests um, as you get what we call macro fouling that's when you get other species getting in, in amongst the assemblage um, and you know so slowly turning into its own little ecosystem on there with the pests joining in and joining hands and then they're getting spread to other places so 
the slime layer is really the um, the ultimate goal. Well, really the ultimate is to be sparkly clean, but um, recognizing that's not always possible. And the gear and equipment, I mean, that's relatively straightforward. Um, like many things and biosecurity on land as well, just cleaning gear before you move it somewhere else. You know, so I think Cody Dybeck's made that quite um, quite a clear message to the public is clean your shoes, you know, so clean your gear, um, pretty simple stuff. And yeah, so really the that's the breakdown of the rules. Um, the fourth rule, the high risk structures, so that um, just to really zoom in on that a bit more, um, that, that would include ports, wharves, marinas, cleaning facilities, maintenance facilities, the haul outs, um, and so on. Um, we'd be working with them to have a, yeah, a good um, biosecurity management program in place um, to manage those risks and uh, ensure surveillance across the board. So I think, have we got any more slides there, Zoe? <laughs> yes, next steps. Right, so May um, was quite an exciting time for a lot of people, I'm sure, with the cabinet budget announcements and um, they call it budget day. So there was a bid put forward. It was relatively positive for marine biosecurity. Great to see represented in there. And um, we anticipate that from that, the, um, the funding that has been flagged for marine biosecurity um, will help to support piloting the clean hull plan as a program across the, the four regions that have already been working in this space. So, you know, we've done the back, background work ready, ready to go. So hopefully that means we can get underway and we will continue to talk with our decision makers and of course mana whenua and um, leading towards a formal consultation process. So that's when everyone has the opportunity to feedback on the actual plan, of course the rules and um, go into the detail should they wish. It's a pretty exciting space for some of us. <laughs> and um, that's a wrap up from us, the top of the north in a nutshell. I'm sure we could have gone on a lot longer about all our awesome work, but um, I just would like to acknowledge the team. And I know a lot of you are online now, but uh, across the regions, there's a lot of amazing people doing all this hard mahi in the background. And thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Is there Thank any you. questions? Thank you, Sam. Um, questions and feedback are, are very welcome. Um, you can put your hand up using the reactions um, button in Zoom or um, just speak up if you, if you wish. <clears throat> no questions. <laughs> can I raise something? You may. Is that Peter? It is indeed. I've put a, I've put a, I've put a camera on. I've actually, um, Sam has, um, we, we've had a little mini private chat in, um, during the course of the presentation. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'd rather look over there, I'll look at the camera. That's a bit silly, let's put this over here. Okay, that's better. Um, as Sam will know, and most of you won't know, I, I'm, I've actually been watching these presentations over the last few weeks. I haven't been able to attend very. In fact, this is the first one I've, I've been able to attend directly um, in person. I've watched pretty much all of them in playback. Um, the uh, my, my situation is that I'm a diver. Um, I'm just a private diver. I'm me. Um, I have a, a little company, which is just me. Um, and I provide um, hull cleaning services in West Haven exclusively. Um, I only work in West Haven. I've actually got a bit of a cold this week, so I'm not diving this week. Um, but generally speaking, I dive one day a week. And um, the boats that I clean are the, um, the racers, the guys who are wanting to keep their boats clean every, every, every two weeks. Um, some of them every four weeks, some of them every two weeks, some of them might be six weeks, but I'm always encouraging them to not go beyond six weeks or maybe two months at the outside because otherwise it gets too bad. Um, uh, Sam was saying just now about, um, you know, the, the light slime only, and that's certainly um, absolutely what I say to all of my customers. And I've got about a hundred or so customers. Um, 
I say to all of them is that all I can clean is light slime only. I'm using a, a, the soft side of a sponge only, and that's it. And if it gets any more than that, then basically it's getting beyond um, what's allowed within the rules. And I'm extremely familiar with what the rules are. Um, having been, um, uh, you know, gone through the process with getting myself registered um, with the marina. Um, I do get fairly commonly um, some new potential customers who come to me and say, can you come and scrape off all the crap on the bottom of my boat? To which I say, well, um, it's unlikely. I'll have a look. I'll have a quick look. And the chances are that I probably will not be able to, because if, if, if it is what you're telling me it is, in other words, a whole bunch of um, you know, macro fouling in, in, in the proper vernacular, um, that then, uh, then no, absolutely, I cannot do that. Um, and so I try and educate them just with what I, with, you know, with, with my own knowledge. Um, but what I was asking Sam is, is there any kind of resources that I can use to maybe educate them better? I'm not particularly personally very familiar with what a lot of these um, uh, worms and tunicates and whatever are. I can't, I, I wouldn't be able to recognize too many of them, although I can easily recognize a fan worm because that's, that's, you know, that's, that's not difficult at all. What I do know, um, and I see it routinely, is there is an awful lot of fan worm in West Haven, like it's everywhere. Um, it's not on the bottoms of boats that I clean because they're all clean. Um, uh, although I, I do see it very occasionally on those. I'll, just, I'll just stop you. Yeah, go on. Peter, I'll just, I'll just stop you there. So you're asking Sam, um, specifically being your Auckland Council representative, if there's any resources or advice that you can give to boat owners? Well, yeah, yeah, and I've actually oh, asked, and yeah. she said, so I'll write, I'll write so, an email address there, but I just wanted to uh, okay. ask. Okay, well, Sam, I think Sam can, Sam can address that question. Thank you. Yeah, but I mean, sorry, the other part very quickly was, are there any, um, is, is there any intention, any plan, any, 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 any um, uh, um, way that, that, that all the fan worm that's in West Haven um, can be cleaned off? Um, is, is there a long-term plan to remove that? Over to you, Sam. Peter. I think um, I can quickly give you some um, quick points on that. So, first of all, no, we'll probably never get rid of fanworm from the inner gulf and um, White's Mataritz is too well established, not just yep. on the structures, but you know, on the the natural seafloor as well. Um, really disappointing, but uh, the the main thing is that marinas don't move, so that's why we you know clean boats before they move because they're the ones that spread pests. Um, there are some really cool, we haven't touched on it all, um, the Marine Biosecurity Toolbox, which is a five-year research um, program. A lot of us are partners and um, you can Google it. It's, there's a lot of awesome work going on in that space. So that's, that includes some research that's looking at preventing the settlement of pests onto artificial structures. Um, so some of the current things they're looking at um, just so using bubbles to prevent them establishing, actually settling and establishing on the structures, um, looking at biocontrol potential, um, looking at recreating essentially natural substrates that native species prefer over the um, invasive species. And then so we can start to incorporate that into the actual um, the building of structures over the years. Um, so yeah, there's just some really exciting work going on in that space, but um, again, I'm happy to continue conversations with you, Peter, and please do feel free to come along to our ID course so we can get your eye in the pests too. Yeah, I will do. I, I, and, I, and I'll write to that email to me as well, thanks. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Great. <laughs> In that case, I think we can um, draw draw this to a close. Um, thank you very much to Sam, Andy, and Caden, and also to everyone that's attended today. We will um, we will post this on YouTube, and a link will be emailed out to you. You can also find the links on marinepest.nz backslash events uh, to all of the all of the uh, online seminars. If, if there's anything you were interested in picking up, thank you. Thanks, Zoe. Thanks, everyone.